Act of Worship, your source for commentary and discussion on worship, theology, and culture. I'm your host, Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Hello and welcome to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones. Thank you for joining me today. We are here in Psalm 98 in the Psalm Project. Psalm 98, and as I mentioned in the last episode, it is one of the kingship psalms, a group of psalms that is headed by Psalm 93, and in Psalm 95 through 100, um, may comprise the remainder of these kingship psalms that praise God as king. It is a it is considered a royal psalm. You may have heard me mention that term before. Um, and some people might consider royal psalms as categories of psalms. And as I've said before, there is no definitive number of categories for psalms. Some people might say there are seven categories. Some might say five. Some might say 12. It, there's no definitive answer to that. Um, some of these psalms may fit in several different categories. Um but I, I would certainly say there are royal psalms. And, um, and to give you an example, Psalm 47, Psalm 93, uh, Psalms 95 through 100 even could be considered royal psalms. And this is no different, Psalm 98. And there is a theme of deliverance which is divided uh, in the psalm into past, present, and future, with the past being verses 1 through 3, the present being verses 4 through 6, and the future being verses 7 through 9. I wrote a hymn many years ago called How Great the Savior's Love Poured Out, and it deals with past, present, and future realities of those who are uh, Christ's people. And so, uh, this is a similar idea here. It talks about the, the deliverance of God's people in the past, in the present, and in the future. And so let me read for you these nine verses of Psalm 98. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of the melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. So we get this command at the beginning of the psalm to sing a new song to the Lord. A new song. Now there are many who would use this scripture and scriptures like it to suggest that we are to only sing new songs to the Lord. And that's not the case. Um, it, certainly we are commanded to sing new songs, okay? So so if, you, if you're not singing new songs to the Lord, you're disobeying a direct order of Scripture. However, that is not to negate old music. Um, I'm reminded in the book of Ephesians, uh, verses 6, uh, or sorry, the, verse, the book of uh, Colossians, ver, uh, chapter 3, verse 16, it says to admonish one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And I think the point that Paul is presenting there is the wide array of music that we can use in the church. I don't, I don't think he's specifically just referencing three categories, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, although the early church certainly utilized the Psalter of the Old Testament in their worship gatherings. 
And so, uh, but th- there was this idea that uh, a complete worship gathering, a complete gathering of God's people would include a variety of types of music. And, um, you know, I, I have for a long time been one that can worship just the same um, through any style, any genre of music, hymns, new songs, polka, it does not matter to me. And uh, most people are not like that. Uh, but the point is that we are to sing to the Lord. And yes, that includes new songs. That should include new songs in our repertoire. And why should we do that? Why should we sing new songs to the Lord? It says in verse 1, For he has done marvelous things. Think about when, if you've been in a, uh, let's say you've been in love, maybe you're married, or you, you know, you've, there's been someone who you are deeply attracted to. Um, when that happens, you are usually trying to figure out ways to please them, to make them happy, to um, impress them, if you will. And you are figuring out creative ways. You are being creative. You want to be new. You want them to experience something they have never experienced before, maybe through your words, what you say to them, or through, uh, you know, if you're a musician, a song you write for them, or poetry, or, or a gift that you give them, something that is new and unique. And that's the idea here. Why a new song? Because our hearts are full, because we are in love with our God, and it, uh, it drives us to create new expressions to God. Otherwise, we just get in this boring rut, this routine that is meaningless to us. And so the new song is a symbol of, of what comes from deep within our hearts, within our souls. Marvelous things. You have done marvelous things. This, this phrase is translated wonderful deeds in Psalm 9-1. All of the amazing acts of God. And then in verse 1, also his right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. In its Old Testament context, the reference here is to a military Victory, but it's appropriate today to apply the verse to a spiritual victory since it is a great victory by God over the cosmic powers. Ephesians 6 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and against authorities and against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. We are guaranteed victory as God's people. Verse 3. He has remembered his steadfast love. This is more than a mere memory. God's remembrance includes his favorable action. And it's not as if God forgets. He is sovereign. He can do whatever he wants. You know, when people say that he forgets our sin, that, that is not theologically true. You know, people say, well, he casts our sin as far as the east is from the west. He forgets it. God does not forget our sin. And what the scripture says is that he remembers it no more. So in his sovereignty, he chooses not to remember it. He doesn't forget it. He chooses not to remember it. That is something that we cannot grasp as humans because we certainly forget I might be the worst of all. I forget so many things. We forget. God does not forget, but in his sovereignty, he chooses not to remember. And so in this verse, he has remembered his steadfast love. It's not as if he has forgotten or he would forget it. But what it's saying is that he has shown his favorable action toward his people. Verse 4. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. This section demonstrates the enthusiastic worship of a people who have a deep love for God. The worship is active. It's noisy. It is boisterous, perhaps. It is lively, and there is nothing wrong with lively worship. 
There's nothing wrong with being excited for what God has done as long as we are doing that in reverence and remembering who he is and who we are and who we are approaching. Verse 7, let the sea roar. So nature here is personified as praising the Lord. He's the creator of everything, animate and inanimate. Psalm 95.5, as we just covered recently, it says, The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Everything is his, and he has made everything for his own joy and for his own pleasure. Verse 8. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together. Again, we see nature personified here. A reminder that everything God has done, he has done for himself. And that includes the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. It was ultimately for the glory of God secondarily for our salvation. Our salvation glorifies him. Verse 9, Before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. Reminded of Psalm 96.10 that says the same thing. He will judge the peoples with equity. In other words, he doesn't rule in this, uh, in this sort of uh, um, fickle way, but he rules with justice and with righteousness, and there is stability. There is fairness in the way that he rules. So Psalm 98 praises God as king. It's another one of these kingship psalms. We will have two more after this, but Psalm 98 does so. And again, I've said it in perhaps maybe a, a less boisterous, less um, lively, if you will, uh, setting that you, than you might expect for such a text. Um, but it is one that is set in a reverent way to remember God and his works and what he has done for his people. So here is Psalm 98 set to music. Thank you for listening today to the Act of Worship podcast. This is Dr. Jonathan Michael Jones.
Let the mountains sing together and rejoice before the Lord. For most surely He is coming, judge of all the earth to be. Justly He will judge the peoples and the 